So a few days ago, I called in sick because of gastric. Besides the pain in my stomach, I suffered also on a shame assault on myself. I was lying on my bed, staring at the ceiling, and my mind goes, "Oh gosh, I'm so unproductive today. I'm not doing anything. I'm behind deadlines now. What am I gonna do? Would my clients think that I'm unprofessional? Would this affect my business deal with them? Would my absence today have any negative consequences to my job, my future, my life? Gosh, this is stressful. When I have this thing on and on in my mind, I can't rest at all." My parents and my closest friends were like, "You have to stay home and rest so that you can recover as soon as possible." So marching orders from them were, "Don't go out, please, don't go out." Um, so I did. I go out, <laughs> and I finish everything I have to do on that day. And you know, Type A overcommitted, busy folks like uh, us. I, I know some of you are, are like that. You know, we we sort of have that kind of superpower, right? Like in the morning when you come out, when you wake up, and you say, "This is the this is the outfit I'm going to wear. This is the fragrance. This is the hair I'm going to set. And this is the craziest face of positivity that I'm going to put on and go in the world today, <laughs> and to get things done. And that's how we face the world to make sure that we maximize our productivity. But I know you know what I'm talking about. When you go when you come home at night. When you're alone and you're at your most authentic version of yourself, you knew something was wrong, and you knew that the busy you out there in the day is kind of like a show—a show of that you're trying to prove to the world that you know you're something that you're not, or you're trying to be pleasing everybody. So I couldn't help but wonder: Why are we always so busy? Why do we always do that to ourselves? We often forget one thing: is that there are a lot of different kinds of human forms. But as a society, we have decided that there's only two kinds: the good one and the bad one. And I think we tend to think in dichotomy because it is a very simple and convenient way to think about it, right? Even when we talk about our efforts and how much uh, how much time we pay or put in for our work and for our kids, it's, it goes like that. Either you are there for your work, or you're not there for your work. Either you are productive, or you are lazy. Either you are a good mom or a bad mom, good boss, bad boss. It's always like that, and we glorify one side as the ultimate benchmark of human achievement, and one is hell. <laughs> so that's how we think about it, right? And we because we glorify that, the only seat that we allow ourselves to take is that side. We cannot go into that side because that's a terrible place to go. So this is how we think as a society. And you know what? Because of that, we are making a cultural statement here. The cultural statement goes like this: Our self-worth now is dictated by our productivity. Our self-worth is being dictated by our productivity, which means in order for you to be worthy of abundance and security. You have to prove and justify to the world that you are making enough money. My question for you is: Are you guys cool with that idea? <laughs> you know, I'm not at all comfortable with this idea. I think it's a terrible idea, and we're not crazy when we think about it. This is how we process that information. Okay? If money could buy the basic human needs, then money could buy life. So, in order for you to earn the right to live a contented life, you have to earn enough money. So, this is a very terrible thing that we have celebrated together as a society for many, many years. But even if I say many years, it's not that many. This is a very recent phenomena. How recent? Um, sociologists, philosophers, historians have coined this era as the capitalism phenomena, right? And this is the thinking that we. Must work for the sake of the money, you know. Over for throughout history, for a long time in history, we used to only work to the extent that our return, the return of our work, satisfies our human needs. But now we work for the sake of money, and this is explained more by sociologist Max Weber on that. So when we are doing this, we thought it is has it has been like this for many many years. So my question is: Is it possible for us to go back to some ancient understanding 
to learn more about this, to see is there any creative resolutions for us to not just be busy all the time. And think about this. If you don't go out and you met a friend and you ask her or him, how do you do it? What do, uh, how are you today? And you will listen to this many times. Your friend would say, I'm super busy today. Oh, I, I have so many things to do. I'm insanely busy. And you would go, I know, right? Me too. I hope that one day could have like 31 hours or what. I, I just, it feels like busyness has become a competition. And with that competition, we have assumed that busy is a badge of honor. It's a virtue. It's something that you should be proud of as a society. And why do we want to do that to ourselves? Is that really a badge of honor? Or is it something else? I think it's a huge misconception here. It's a, mis it's a huge misconception here. And because I wanted to understand why people think that way, so when I interview a lot of people and understand why do we think they're so busy, why, do I, why are they busy for? So this is the flow that I realized. Because we think that busy means you are productive. So being productive would show that you are worthy. And because you are worthy, you can now live a happy life, you can get whatever you want, be successful, or how I put it, you can live in the wonderland where unicorn and rainbow live in harmony. You know? This is the process that we all believe together. Is this true? Is this true? Let us go into each of them and see, okay? Now, busy. Um, I, I, I have a, I'm very lucky to have a job that I really like to work on. But a lot of people, they're working in, this is what we call the capitalist machine, you know, where the job is so repetitive, and every single day, tomorrow seems exactly the same as today, and you're trapped there thinking that, you know, what am I doing here? You're trapped in this work that you don't like. And... Um, and sometimes the job seems like it's designed to suck the joy, humanity, and spontaneity out of you. It's very normal to feel like that. Um, the problem is, because we think that being busy gives you productivity, and being productive shows that you are worthy, and you're going to get the life that you wanted, we buy into the hope that being busy is the easy way out. Being busy is the only way to make you escape from the suffering. So it's a promise. But in fact, it's a broken promise. Just because you have a J-O-B doesn't mean that you're going to live a good life, right? We all know that. So busy does not promise that. It's a broken promise. What about productivity? Productivity is also a very, very tricky thing. We all have our to-do list, right? If you finish everything today, we get things done, then we are a very productive person. And sometimes, we are, it's nearly impossible for us to escape from digital connectivity now. So every time, we will need to fill in tasks within all the moments that we are free. And because of, we need to respond to emails, respond to SMS, it's responsible people, we will instantly be required to do more things that we have to do. And it's a very, very interesting thing to think about that way. Is life really about getting things done? Is that the purpose of life? I think getting things done is important. But then, life is actually about getting the right things done, right? So if this is the misconception that we all have it, with busy and productivity, is there a way for us to come together and reconstruct a perception towards what busyness can or cannot bring to us? So I've been thinking about that a lot of times. And the reason I'm thinking about it is because when we buy into that lie, we feel like our lives are not inherently valuable, that we need to earn the entitlement and the permission to live the life that we wanted to really go to the wonderland of your life. But sometimes busyness is just a state of your life. You know, it's just a state of your mind, and it's just how life is. But the meaning that we attach to it changes the whole experience. So I wanted an answer to that, the entitlement of it, the entitlement to still celebrate your life in a different way, even though you're busy. There's a guy called Chris Gullibo. He made a wish when he was really young. He said that he's going to travel to all, of the world, uh, all around the world before 35. So before he starts his journey, he did this. Whatever I'm going to plan, 
it has to follow these three criteria. The first thing is this thing needs to be challenging. All right, he wants to travel around the world. Fine, that's challenging. The second thing, it needs to be measurable. So how do you measure that? He will he will think that okay, I want to go to all 193 countries around the world. So that's measurable. I can collect the stamps on my on my passport. So that's measurable. The third thing is it, it requires sacrifice. Of course, you want to travel around the world. You need to that it requires a lot of money. It, it will take a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice. So he embarked on this journey for many years. So just two years ago, in 2013. He has successfully traveled around all of the countries in this world, and he's now traveling around the world again to talk about his journey, his life quest, about his the happiness of pursuit. So he advocates for life quests. So I couldn't help but wonder: Would life quest be the answer to my question? Would a very well-defined, well-crafted life quest that we can take on be the answer to? The life that we wanted to have, the wonderland we wanted to be at. Even though I was busy, is it possible for us to steal a moment of time to have a life quest there, so that we can still get to where we wanted to be? So, I made the, I go through the criteria and make sure that everything I do, based on that, and I seldom share things that I haven't worked out internally, and uh, I or something that I haven't tested on myself. So what I did for the past three months is that I research around all, with all books and around the world and see is there any life quest that is worth trying. I have a very occupied life. I have a lot of things. I'm overcommitted, but I believe that there's still time that I can still to have all these life quests. And I research a lot of things. And if you want to have life quest, if you share the vision and you wanted to take a step and try it, there are a few examples that I'm going to share later. That you can consider. So the first thing that I consider is meeting new souls. This is very insp inspiring. When I look at the uh, project called the 100 Strangers Project by Flickr, so it is getting all the photographers to take 100 pictures of strangers and talk to them and meet them. And you put it on Flickr, you can see a lot of people being photographed. It's a little bit like Humans of New York, right? So I figured I'm not a photographer, but can I? Meet 100 strangers and talk to them. I've done that. It's been very, very amazing. I've met 30, some, 30 something of them, and I hope to meet more, maybe from some of you here. And uh, how do I document my experience with them? Is that I use an app called StoryCore. StoryCore is a very interesting project. Uh, it used to be a booth. In America, where people can go in there and talk to their loved ones and record it, so that all the recordings of the conversation will be recorded in the Library of Congress, Archive of Congress, or something. So now they have developed an app for you to record all the conversations that you wanted to record just by using your phone. So I've been using that. I've been enjoying that app a lot, a lot. So you can try it. You can meet a lot of new souls, and you can meet new souls right here. And they're amazing. The second thing that I've also tried is called daily snack size learning.、Um, we are TEDxers. We run TEDx shows, and in the TED community, we really, really encourage a lot of people to watch TED talks every single day. Well, it's the same as reading a book every single day, but having the time or having the, you know, the quality time and the focus to sit there and to read, it's not easy. So instead, what we encourage, what we are encouraged to do is. To listen to one TED talk per day, so I did for the past 30 days. If you're on my Facebook, you'll see me posting TED talks every single day. I watch one; it's just 10 to 15 minutes. And what I would do is, after I listen to that talk, I would come up with the idea itself, like title, my own title for this talk, and put it up there, and to find the best part of the talk that I love from the transcript and post it down there and share it with my friends. That 30 days was amazing. I'm so inspired every single day. And besides doing that, I also realized that there's a lot of time、uh, when we're driving, when we're waiting for someone. You could listen to audiobooks. You can download audiobooks from Audible or just from YouTube, and you can learn things from there. And it's just audio, so you don't need to just to pay too much attention to that thing. And it can just be a very good accompany too. So that's what I think very very interesting that you can try as well. The third thing is joining a class.、Um, 
I think this is very important. If you want to really change something, right, you need to sort of sign a contract. And I think <laughs> joining a class is signing a contract. If you just say that, you know, um, I'm going to go jogging today, you know, most likely you're not going to go there because you're only responsible for yourself, right? But if you sign up for something, there's a contract there, you would go because you are someone that honors contract, right? So you would go. So if you could do that for yourself in terms of the change that you wanted to do, join a class and maybe you will get, it, you will get on track on that thing. So I, I got crazy about it. You know, I have yoga Tuesdays, I have badminton Wednesdays, and I have hip-hop dancing on Thursdays. Really, when I go a little bit swag. <laughs> I love it. And it's, it's, it's really interesting that when we honor contracts, sometimes it's not just a, an actual contract, a membership on the gym or something, but a contract between you and your friends, a promise that you make that we're going to do it every, every week. It really changes the way. Fourth is quantify itself. I was at a session with Cheryl Yeo from Magic, and she shared one of the ways that she's using to monitor her productivity. Uh, it's called quantified self. She measures everything. And one of the things she measures is her sleep quality. So there's a, an app called Sleep Cycle that she puts beside her bed every, every night. And in the morning, you would see the percentage of her sleep quality, like how much score that you have, you have made by sleeping. I think this is really interesting. So I got all crazy with that. So for the past three months, I've been measuring everything, like everything, sleep quality every night. My average is 69%. <laughs> and I also document every single thing that I eat for the past three months. Everything that I eat, I will put it in front of me and I'll put my hands as a scale and I take it. I document every day and I send it to a few of my friends that are doing the same things as well. And the third thing is I weigh myself every night. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's quite scary when I started to do that, but I realized that it's a very interesting experiment that I can do with myself because now I know how I really live my life. I know where to hack it when I have all this data. I think that's how big data works, right? When you really know everything about yourself, that you can finally adopt the right strategy to do it well. So it's interesting. The fifth thing is called the minimalist challenge. Um, there's a website, uh, a group of young men came out with this idea, the minimalist movement, where they require or encourages us to just be minimalist. The idea was to get rid of things so that you have more space for things that are actually important for you. So one of the challenges that they suggested to us to do is that you throw away one thing on Monday, two things on Tuesday, 14 things on the 14th day, and 30 things in, uh, on 30, uh, the 30th day. We did it. We, as a group, my team in IAM, everyone does that. So uh, it, instead of just doing it for 30 days, we do it weekly basis. So Monday, one thing. Seven day, uh, uh, on Sunday, seven things. And Monday, you go back to one thing. You know, that act itself made our room so clean. <laughs> We are looking for things to throw away every day. It's so fun. And sometimes we're really, really, we're not at home and we don't have anything to throw away. We look through our Facebook page. Who should I throw away today? You know? We really do that every day. And, and it's really fun. We're still doing it. And it's really fun. And you should do it. Decluttering your life, sometimes it's so effective because you create space in your mind also. And the way we do it is not just throwing things away. We will put it and take a picture and name it. Before we throw it away, you name it. So you sort of like have this process. Why do I have this in the first place? You assess, you re evaluate the necessity of having this thing in the future. So it's really fun. The last thing that I tried, the last thing that I tried is not here, but it's called the jar of happiness. The jar of happiness is suggested by Liz Gilbert, the author of Eat, Pray, Love. You, you buy a very nice jar, and then you decorate it. And every single day, at the end of the day, you write something that you're happy about, grateful for your life, and then just put it in there. So as you accumulate all these little, little things in the jar of happiness, this is a proof that you have a happy life to live. So I think that is a very beautiful way, a beautiful metaphor that you can adopt to really, really live a happy life too. So... Does all those life quests be the answer to the question that asked us now, whether or not busyness can bring us to where we want to go? Does that guarantee the happy life, the wonderland life that we always wanted? 
Honestly speaking, I don't believe so. I don't believe that's the way because I believe that there's a million other ways for us to do it. But then, the question that we really, really need to always ask ourselves is, why not? Why not? I think we need to understand that we are not just here to produce bricks. We are not just here to produce bricks for society to stand on. We are also here to celebrate the miraculousness of our unique life in any possible ways, in our limitation, within our limitation. And if you can do that, if you can believe that, it really changes a lot of things. And I think every time when we feel and believe and choose to believe that even if we are so busy, we are still entitled and we are still allowed to live that kind of life that we want, creates a tiny piece of curiosity inside us. And that tiny piece of curiosity says, I'm alive enough that I want to see what that is. And when you start to believe in that, it shifts everything. It shifts everything. So in order to really, really reach out to that direction and to live that kind of life, it's a long, long, long way to go. But then, before we can do anything, before we can start any life quest, the first thing, the very, very first thing that you have to do is to stop glorifying being busy. Thank you very much.